right, well, John asked me just to kind of go over the story, um, how I got to, from sitting in, the, sitting in those seats. Well, I wasn't in the front. I was in the back, usually. But um, my co-founder, he was in the front, and I was in this information systems class at BYU. Um, I grew up, my dad's a colonel in the Marines and a pilot for an airline, and we never talked about business, ever, uh, until his company started going on strike, and, and um, I started following the Houston Chronicle every day. Grew up in Chicago, my senior high school was Houston, just finding out what was going on with Continental Airlines. And it was interesting to me, it was really interesting. And then I uh, was a business major, I had seven different majors at BYU, and uh, I had this class to learn about computers. And the, remember the first day of class, the teacher's like, so, uh, I, just still, I still remember one of, the, one of the things he's like, he's like, so now we have, um, it's like they started out with OC1s and now we have OC2 connections and every once in a while we're seeing OC, OC4s. And um, this kid on the front row raises his hand, he's like, actually, sir, they have OC196s. And I was like, I have no idea what they're talking about. And it happened like two more times. He corrected the teacher three times the first day of class. And the teacher announced that we had four group projects that day. And I was like freaking out. Like I don't even know what Excel is. Uh, well, no one at BYU did because we were all still stuck in the word perfect, you know, the word perfect, uh, yeah, I don't know what that was. Quattro Pro, I think, yeah. And um, so I walked up to this kid after class and said, hey, you know, love to be your friend. Definitely need to be in your group. And he's like, yeah, sure. And uh, I got two other guys, we're all in his group, and he helped us do all of our homework. He's a pretty smart kid. And um, then I called him a lot for business ideas that I had, because I really, once I got into the entrepreneurship program, I loved it. I just went to every lecture series. I stopped taking all GEs. I just started taking every entrepreneurship class I could take. Um, didn't quite finish, but uh, got, um, I was calling him about an idea one time, and he said, hey, do you just want to make websites with me? I just got someone to pay me 250 bucks to make a website. I'm like, yeah, sure. And so I just got the phone book out and literally started calling anybody that had a big yellow page ad. And um, it was uh, first customer. I saw The Godfather a couple days ago, Joe Olivier, uh, just yesterday actually, my very first investor. And um, he was a professor at a university and he gave me advice for free for a year and a half when I had my business going. And my first customer that uh, I landed was 4,800 bucks and he stiffed me the whole bill. Um, and so I called, I called my professor, I'm like, what do I do? He's like, oh, let's go to small claims court. So I went to small claims court that day. I sued him, because I'm like, he's got a shiny new Toyota MR2. I want this guy's money. I was so mad. <laughs> and uh, and um, you know, so I was like 22-year-old kid taking this 45-year-old guy to court. And um, I was like, I'll pick at your house. Like, I will mess you up, I promise you. <laughs> and, so we settled, they paid me 2,800 bucks. Um, but so at least, you know, we still made money because it only cost me like 1,200 bucks to make it. But um, the thing that everyone started asking us was, and by the way, you guys, I love questions. And um, so any questions you have along the way, feel free. Uh, and I'll leave some time for questions at the very end as well. But uh, take this any direction you want. So anyway, went first, uh, when we were making websites, everyone started asking us, you know, I'm literally 22, 23 years old, and Zions Bank was paying us like $50,000 a month. Um, and I remember when we were going up there to pitch those guys, and uh, you know, I guess we should wear a suit, and you know, these other ad agencies were leaving like these giant brochures in there, and like we didn't, we didn't know any of that, so we're like staying up. We pulled all-nighters. I was doing like three, four all-nighters a week for a couple of years. And um, I remember my record was 114 hours in six days, because I tried not to work on Sunday. You can add up the hours, it's a lot. Um, and we went and, uh, you know, we'd, again, they're paying us $50,000, $40,000 a month. My family, Ancestry.com, was the same thing. And then they would say, well, what happened with our website? What's going on? I just paid you all this money. It's pretty, but is it doing anything? I don't know. Um, you know, and so we would try to install analytics. And some of the analytics that we'd install, uh, it was all software, traditional software, like on a CD. Uh, which I don't even know if they make that anymore, but I ever saw all the software was on a CD and you get it and you get a server, which is just a bigger computer, and you put it on a desk in the corner, connect it to the internet, and then try to put all the log files on it. And so you download all the log files from the internet, put it onto the server about how much traffic Zions Bank was getting, and then you'd install software on it that would try to analyze the traffic 
And you know, you could get a big enough machine that it would take maybe 20, 30 minutes to run to crunch all the data. And then the problem is they were only getting 20,000 hits a day, and then they'd get mentioned in USA Today. And then Ancestry's traffic would double to 50,000 hits in a day. And now it takes three hours to get the data out. And um, I remember one time it took three days to get the data out, and no one knows what's going on. The, server, the website's down. No one had a clue what was going on. And so we're like, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so we went and we made, we started probably, every money, all the dollars we made, we were billing, we were billing out, we were hiring um, students for 10 bucks, 12 bucks an hour. You know, minimum wage was like six. So students thought they were getting, like, making mint. And I was billing them out at, I started billing them out at 65 bucks an hour. And then I remember my econ class and learned about price, price elasticity, elasticity. I mean, I learned pretty much, the way I run my business today, it's, most of it's from like my econ class, my accounting class. I still feel like I know as much as my CFOs ever know just from my couple accounting classes. But I loved them, I loved all of them. And uh, you know, went and um, price elasticity. So I was like, next customer we got, and like I charged them 85 bucks. Didn't, didn't flinch. Next customer we got charged them $105. That was scary, over $100. And then we charged $125. And, in, and eventually ended up getting to like 185 bucks an hour. But we were still paying 10 bucks, 12 bucks an hour. So it was good. It was really good money. But every dollar that we got, we would take and plow into all these other crazy ideas that we had. Um, and I mean, we probably blew 20,000 bucks on nine or 10 different things, um, which again, you know, for those of you that are poor in the room, that's, that, I was the exact same boat, and, and I still hadn't taken any money out. And in addition to that, now I was taking the 20,000 um, bucks, and instead of taking it home, I also had another $60,000 in credit cards, and I'd never gotten a student loan, because I'd been in commercials when I was a kid, and I modeled because I looked like I was eight when I was 16. So you're really mature for an eight-year-old model. Um, but I'd taken that money, and piled it up, and so that's what I was, you know, that's what I was living on. But then, so I got sixty thousand dollars in student car, student uh, loans and credit cards, not necessarily advisable, but I did it like five thousand bucks at a time. And so the twenty thousand dollars would come in, and we're like, we always wanted to do this virtual server idea, which is really funny. But we had this company called, um, it was called J Servers, and put twenty thousand bucks into it, and it's pretty much was, you know, Amazon's AWS. Um, it was fun being on the internet back then because you could do anything. I just didn't have, we just didn't have money to do everything. And then we had, there was another company went public called Website Pros and we did the exact same thing as them. There was a company called GeoCities that sold for four and a half billion dollars to uh, Yahoo? Oof. I'm way back when. Um, and we did the exact same thing as them. So we had all these different businesses. We're trying to figure out which one uh, to focus on, which one we liked. And being in Utah, especially back then, there were, not, there were not investors throwing their money around. I mean, John was actually the most tech-oriented investor we had out of 45. Um, and he was in Seattle. Um, and he came from the Yellow Pages industry. So it wasn't like, you know, tech geek completely. Um, but definitely went tech earlier than anybody else in that space. So I had an affinity towards tech. But that affinity towards tech, that was like my most sophisticated tech investor. Um, the other 90% of them were just real estate people that owned like apartment complexes. Um, and we uh, finally, we had one company that um, we went out and we put a bunch of, we got a bunch of uh, shareware basically, a bunch of um, scripts that you use to write code websites. So if you wanted to put a guest book or a message board or um, you know, any of the, you know, anything like that or a video streaming content, you could go to this website and you could get the code to do that so you wouldn't have to rewrite it. And I noticed on the internet at the time, there wasn't anybody that had more than like 100 scripts that were basically just linking to different freeware and shareware that was out there. So I went and got, um, went and got a, a, a student, paid him six bucks an hour, and he got 5,000, he found 5,000 on the web. We put it all, um, we launched it all, we had 5,000 scripts, we put 12,000 bucks into it with his salary, and about five months later, I sold it for $200,000. And again, it was in, you know, for those of you that were poor, some of you were probably sponsored. I wasn't sponsored. Um, at least that's what we called it. You guys are dry. I mean, barely even smiles from some of you guys. <laughs> Gosh. Um, 
But is anybody sponsored in here and not ashamed of it by your parents? Uh, one. I got one sponsor. Yeah. I wasn't sponsored. Parent people walk around sponsored and they're shiny new cars. I was taking the bus, man. Um, so yeah, we called it. Those of us that were really poor, we called them sponsored. Um, I couldn't get a sponsorship. But we, uh, yeah, after that, um, we sold for 200,000 bucks and it was such a stark contrast to billing hours. You know, because when we were billing hours, um, Friday at four o'clock, Zion's Bank would call and say, hey, we need these 25 things changed right now. We just had a meeting with our VP. You need to get it done. We're embarrassed. Like, so I'd go to my, you know, go to my engineers, be like, um, it's Friday at four, but I really need you to stay and do this. They're like, yeah, screw that. Um, and then you pay them 20 bucks an hour. They're like, yeah, I don't think so. And you pay them 40 bucks an hour. They're like, you don't understand. You know, it's not about the money. It's about the respect. I'm like, what? So confused. <laughs> like, I want the money. And uh, so, you know, having those two very opposite experiences, and then we had a couple of ideas, and one of them was analytics, um, and we gave it away for free. So Google Analytics, you know, we were six years ahead of that. And the um, problem is I didn't have a giant pay-per-click business to, you know, monopolistic best business in history. I didn't have that to support my, you know, free analytics business. So we had to get rid of that and start, we started charging 10 bucks, 20 bucks a month. And then eBay came along and CNET came along. I don't know if CNET even exists anymore, do they? Oh, yeah. Do they? Okay. Um, eBay and CNET came along and, and uh, in the same month and said, hey, can you, that thing you're doing for those little small businesses, can you do it for us? And it's like, yeah, yeah, of course we can do that for you, you know, game face. Um, well, how much, do you guys, how much do you guys charge for that? Uh, I'm like, well, for your site, it would be about $10,000 a month. You know, I was just making stuff up, but, and it, I wasn't even close. We ended up getting, you know, we ended up getting half a million dollars a month from uh, eventually. Um, but, you know, 10,000 bucks a month, I thought that was like the best thing that ever happened to us. And then we, um, you know, everyone's heard about the bubble bursting in 2000. We actually agreed to sell the company for 65 million bucks. We had like $2 million in revenue, or uh, I guess four, four million, three and a half, three point nine million dollars in revenue um, in 2000. And someone came along and offered us $65 million. I'm like, yeah, I'm not an idiot. Like, we're not even have a business yet. Um, and so they paid, so we announced it. The governor came down, the like, news cameras came down. We were like these, at the time, let's see, how old were we? 27 years old. Um, you know, and just sold the company for 65 million bucks. And um, remember we were like on the radio and then a month later it fell apart. Um, because then after the bubble burst in like March, April, then the economy got really bad. It, like it was like there was a second one in October, um, November. And I was shocked, I'm still shocked today, but we had a clause. Because you, when you do a big deal like that, it takes a while. You don't shake hands and then here's the check. You know, it's like you do due diligence and the lawyers do a bunch of stuff and they're a public company, so you had to wait for a couple other things. And they had another transaction that was closing and it was going to be like $150 million for them. And so we said, if your transaction doesn't close, then you agree that we can walk away and you will pay us $1.7 million in a breakup fee. Uh, because at the time we had another deal on the table to um, get some investments, and they did. Of course, their deal didn't close. Close, so we walked away, and there was a guy from IBM on their board, and uh, the company was called NetObjects, and NetObjects went out of business, um, and like one of the very last things they did was take the $1.7 million that they still had out of 10 million, they owed like $50 million to people, dollars to people and they gave us 1.7 million bucks. I still, I really still shot, I mean, it's what they should have done, but still no one, my experience is very, very, very few people are as ethical as they should be. Most people just hide behind the fact, well, it's just business, well, the contracts, or well, lawyers, so there's another way to interpret it. That's 99% of my experiences. And uh, this guy, Mike Zisman at IBM said, yeah, I'll pay you the, We'll pay the $1.7 million. And we lived on that for the next two years. And um, that uh, we had the small business division. Yeah. So you said people don't have very good ethics. Yeah. How do you combat that? How do you get around that? What do you do? Because I mean, there's not much you can do. Just try not to get too jaded. 
I mean, for me, you kind of start losing hope in humans. I definitely had a couple years where I was like, I don't trust, I don't trust anybody, and you know, even the people I trust, I'm sure they're going to screw me at some point. It sucks, but it's just there's very, very, very few people that I used to think <clears throat> you can, you can. Well, I'll give you a story. So I had uh, one time in I got the 1.7 million dollars. Um, about six months later, we were trying to raise some money. When the heck was this? No, it was 99. We were trying to raise some money. We had a bridge loan. It was like the that's what I mean. It was like the end of 99. Feb, I mean, like November, December of 99. And we thought we were going to raise six million bucks in three months, which we did. But we were trying to get a bridge loan, just trying to get some money to hold us over because we were burning probably like hundred thousand dollars a month or something like that. And um, I went to some of my investors, talked to like 30 of them. And I got five of them to agree to give me $400,000. One guy was giving me 200, and then the other um, guys were giving me like 50 grand each. And they said, if I get to 400, you know, if you get to 400, I'll give you the 50. I'm like, great. So I go around and find another investor, be like, hey, John, I got, I got 300. If I, I can get all 300 if I get to 400. Can you give me 100? He's like, okay. How, what does that do for you? I'm like, it gives us, you know, we've got 200 in the bank. It gives us, we'll be six months. And John doesn't want to give me only 100 because then it might be the last 100. But if it's part of 400 or 500, you know, maybe. So I'm like, I got commitments for all of it. You know, I need, I, I, and all I need is your 100 and I'm at, I, I'm at the magic number. So I got to the magic number, went back to all these investors and the economy, there was some like bad news in the economy. Every single one of them bailed on me. And there was one guy that literally knew the least about what I did. We were just friends, and he's like, oh, he's like, the, he's like real estate's just getting killed. Rates are changing like crazy. He's like, I really, he's like, I really, I really need to get out of this deal. Um, and he was the only guy that actually sat down and talked to me and said, I need to get out of the deal. And I said, well, I can't tell you that you can get out of it. That's your call, because I still need it. So I took your commitment. And I run my business based on your commitment. And he said, he said, okay, you know, I'll give you the two hundred thousand dollars. It's gonna hurt me, but I'll give it to you. And that saved the company. I mean, I had four of the guys that were all multimillionaires that all bailed on fifty thousand bucks. You know, I don't trust them at all. And that's just kind of the way things. It's just the way things go. I mean, it's just the way things. I don't know why things go that way. But I had another guy who was in San Francisco. Um, he agreed to pay us. Uh, we agreed, we were, when, we were, when we had a free service, we had ads that supported the free service. So we had a bunch of ads that were out there, and we agreed, he agreed to pay us like $2 for every, every thousand that we ran. And we get to the end, and we send him the bill, and they, he, one of his guys called us back and said, we're not paying you $2 because they didn't perform as well as we wanted to. You don't buy a commercial and then say it didn't perform the way you wanted to and pay a different amount. What are, you, what are you talking about? And you know, it's like if you're out of money and you're literally going out of business and you need to negotiate, that's one thing. But you just don't like it. And uh, you know, so my guy was fighting with him, and I just let him keep on fighting. I'm like, no, don't back down. No, that's not right. I don't even care about the money. It's not principle. It's not right. And uh, I'll never forget. This is one of the other positive moments. I have like three. Um, and this guy, he gets on the phone. I'll never forget, he gets on the phone. His name is Chris Redlitz. And he gets on the phone. Um, so myself and he were the ones that did the deal. And there's a contract and then our two guys. And we're talking and our two guys are fighting back and forth. And my guy's like, well, you guys agreed to pay us $2. And then he listened to his guy, Dave, was saying something. And then Chris, the CEO over at the other company, said, Dave, shut up. What are you talking about? You know I agreed to pay $2. I don't care what the freaking contract says. Pay him the two dollars, you know. And it was like it was like twenty thousand bucks, something like that. Um, but I'd never seen I'd never seen that before. And that was when I was really young. I was like twenty four, twenty five, and I saw that and said, you know, he's like, I don't care what the lawyers say. I don't care what the accountants say. I know whose hand I shook, and I know what deal I did. You know, I don't care what the investors say. I don't care what my board says. That's what I agreed to. So that's that. You know, if someone wants to fire me for that, they can fire me for that. But that's what I agreed to. Period. End of story. So those kind of things when they happen, you know, that would I, I hold on to those things. Um, and then I used to think that you see the real colors, someone's real colors when they get hired and fired. Um, but then too many of my friends that I love to death, I'd watch them like 
get terminated for some reason, like at Adobe when we sold, when we sold to Adobe. Because um, I sold Omnitrue to Adobe for $1.8 billion. And uh, then we had a bunch of employees. And like all, all these guys had made multimillionaires. And they had do things on the way out the door. I just was shocked by. I mean, just floored by. So then I'm like, okay, well, that, that's not a true statement anymore. You can't tell someone's true color. So then I started saying, my only way to like think about it is like, when you're hiring and firing somebody, like this has nothing to do with who they are and the fabric of who they are because they're crazy. People were crazy. And it's like, I don't know if it's like this innate thing, like Jean Valjean, you'll steal bread to like feed your family. I don't know what it is, but it's, there's something really crazy that happens to people when they get hired, when they get fired. So I just try to write it off and not think about it too much because I'd hate my brothers and my friends and, you know, so, and I'm, you know, I've, I've only been in that position once and I got fired and got sued. So, you know, who knows? Um, but yeah, after, so after that, our business did a million dollars that year in 2001, and then it did 3 million, 8 million, 20 million, 40 million, 80 million, 160 million, 300 million, 400 million, 500 million, 700 million, 900 million, it's over a billion and a half dollars now. Um, and it was the fastest growing public software company all three years that we were public, right here in Utah, fastest growing public software company in the world three years in a row. Um, thanks. And it was also kind of cool because, um, you know, the time, like I, I just told the story just a few days ago, but there was this guy uh, I was talking to one time in 99, pitching on my business too, and he was really excited. He's like, wait, 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 where are you guys? Utah. And he turns around and walked away. And um, Neil Weintraut, 21st Ventures. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he, um, I, I, that, I, I really didn't, I didn't like the perception that sometimes people had about Utah, and I always thought it'd be cool if we could help change that. And just, you know, there's a lot of great companies here, and we all kind of play a small part in that. But that's something that, um, I really enjoy doing, and um, it was so it was fun being the fastest growing public software company. There was a thousand deals that were that VCs invested in in 2004 across the globe, and we were the number one performing deal out of every single investment. Um, I was the youngest CEO of a public company all three years that we were public. Uh, and actually, a funny story: I met Zuckerberg one time in Davos, and their company wasn't public yet. And you know, Eric, he's always getting harassed, and I don't really, I definitely am not going to go around like begging someone for their time. I'm not interested in that. I kissed butt way too long. You know, so when we, when we finally made it, I was like, yeah, I'm done with that. Um, but I saw this guy uh, sitting there. He was by himself. And Facebook wasn't really huge yet. Um, and he was sitting there in his hoodie in Davos in some hotel by himself on his Blackberry. And I was walking by and I stopped him and I said, hey, Mark, you know I'm the youngest CEO of a public company, right? And he's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I don't want you to go public because I lose the title. And that's how I got to know Mark. But... Um, <laughs> It was, uh, you know, and then, and then uh, once we sold, um, so we were public for three years. I was a lot of fun. I liked being a public company. Um, made over, over uh, 50 millionaires. Almost, there was almost 100 millionaires. People, the people made like over $900,000. But we had over 50 millionaires um, from our employee base. Um, you know, some guys that made 40, 50 million bucks. Uh, a bunch of guys in the 5 to 10 range, guys using that unisex. Um, and then we had over, uh, I mean, I had one investor that put in, I had one investor, I don't know what kind of return you got, John, but I had one investor that put in, um, I'm very happy. yeah, one investor put in, let's see, the best one, a guy put in $400,000 in 2002, yeah. and um, then a million dollars in 2003, and on the $400,000, uh, he made over $100 million. That was, yeah, that's the one I turned down. That was. That's <laughs> right. It's, it's good to be in the place where you get to turn those down, though. Yeah. Right? It's better to be turning them down than not being. Not. No one's begging you for money. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was. You know, it was. A, it was a good ride. Then I started Domo, um, and Domo basically it's get all your data in one place. So on my phone, you know, I've got payroll data, sales data, pipeline data, um, how many customers are happy, what they're saying. Um, data about how many leads we're getting, and you know it comes from probably 40 different systems. Data all in one place on your cell phone. I get a text message if my sales are up by X percent. If they're down, um, I get uh, you know. So that's 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 what um, our product does. We've got a thousand customers now. Um, we've raised an enormous amount of money. You know, at Omniture we were like the number one returning uh, investment of all time for almost all of our uh, major investors. 
and you know, whereas here, I went out in my very first round, um, you know, before we even had, um, well, all we had was a PowerPoint, and we got a $130 million valuation on the very first round. So that was, that was pretty cool, too, because I got beat up. I got beat up. I felt a little beat up after. So when I, I left Adobe, I still can't really talk about a lot of details, but um, basically they said that I was, there was a lawsuit, um, and they said that I was stealing their trade secrets and hiring their employees and a whole bunch of other things that maybe sound like a horrible, amoral, unethical person. And I kind of took it for about a year, and then I lost my mind because the legal process wasn't working the way I wanted it to. And so I started talking to the press, and that started embarrassing them, and they really hated it. And then somehow we got things resolved um, without, without any money changing hands. So, um, but you know, after that, I did kind of feel beat up, and so there was, it was funny. I, um, I remember there was engineers that were leaving Google, and Google was so hot five years ago, right? Engineers were leaving Google and uh, Facebook, and they were getting, I remember there was one guy that got a $60 million valuation because it was two you know, of the early engineers um, and, and an idea. And so I was like, I don't know, maybe I can get $30 million, maybe I can get a $40 million valuation. And I was talking to one of my friends, one of my, he's one of my banker friends at Morgan Stanley, and he's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know, would help me, you know? And he's like, he's like, you, have, you used to have swagger, man. Like, what's going on? You think investors want you to come in? Like, what are you doing? And he's like, those guys are engineers. Like, you're a CEO. You've done it before. You've been CEO. You, you built the company, and now you're going to go be CEO and build the company again. He's like, you should be getting a $100 million valuation. I'm like, yeah, what's wrong with me? Like, I really got, I really got screwed up in the head there for a few months. And uh, so, yeah, I went out and got a $130 million valuation, raised like, um, first round raised 60 million bucks, second round raised uh, another 65 million bucks, and then raised 125 million bucks a year ago, and then raised $200 million. Um, we just announced it like a week ago. Yeah? What do you mean first round, second round, third round? So when you have a company, what do you think about valuations and stuff is like, um, Let's say you have, you know, let's say you have a building and it's this great building and you think, you know, people are willing to come in and it's a skate park. They come in and they get to skate in the winter. It's just a building. They just screw around and skate. You're like, you know, I make all this money off of it. So this building, my business, it's worth, I think it's worth like three million bucks. But I want to put a skate park outside and I think if I do, I'm going to be able to really increase my revenue. And instead of being worth three million bucks, I think I can make it worth 30 million bucks. So you go to an investor and you're like, but it's gonna cost me a million bucks. Like, okay. So you raise a million bucks. If it's worth $3 million, that's the pre-money valuation. The way you think about it is this building's worth $3 million. If you take a million dollars in cash and put it inside the building, it's clearly worth $4 million now. Because without the cash, it's three. With, it's four. So that's pre-money, three. Post-money, post the money going in, four. They have 25%, because one million of four million is 25%. So, um, then you take that million and you go build a skate park and because you already have all the customers coming in, you know, now instead of generating whatever revenue you were generating before, you're not generating a lot more because you've got a big skate park in the back. And so that's the first round of financing. So let's say it does exactly what you think it's going to do. And now your business, you're like, it's worth 30 million bucks. Then you're like, you know what? I think we can go out a really cool bike park as well and a wave pool. And that's going to cost us another 5 million bucks. So we want to raise 10 so we've got enough cash. So now it's worth 30, I'm going to raise another 10 million bucks. So again, building skate park, put 10 million bucks in, it was worth 30, now it's worth 40. They bought another 25%. The guys that put in a million bucks, they don't own 25% anymore because it's 25% minus 25% dilution for the new guys. So first round, second round, keep going. Um, so, you know, beginning you own 100% and then you own less, 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 less. And if you can get public and you own, you know, 15, 20%, things, are, things went pretty well. Um, and a lot of times there's, you know, like an Omniture went public and there was two of us and we still owned, I think at the time we still, owned, we'd, we'd sold some shares right before the IPO, we still owned like 15% each when we went public. So it was like 30% still in our hands. Um, here I've raised, you know, 450 million bucks. Um, I started, right when I bought it, I mean, right when I uh, started the company, like a month later I bought another company and I gave them 25% because I felt like it was in a fast forward to what I wanted to do by two years. And then I raised $450 million on top of that. And so like, I'm down to like 25, 26%. But 25% of two billion is not bad, you know? So, 
Yeah, but it's, it's also on paper, so it could be worth zero tomorrow. I've lived that as well. You just never know. The goal always seems to go public for most companies. Is there ever a time when you want to stay private? Yeah, for sure. There's lots of companies that should never go public. Um, it's kind of, you have to figure out, there's like, I mean, there's some companies that are lifestyle companies. Like if you're running restaurants, they're like high-end restaurants, that's a cash flow company. That's not, that's not a, I mean, there's very few high-end restaurants that have enough stores that could go public, like P.F. Chang's. And even then, then it starts kind of going down and people aren't as excited about it as they were, you know, 15 years ago. So most of those companies, you know, you stay private. Um, you also have to figure out your lifestyle. You know, if you, want, if you want to just ride the private plane and do lots of crazy things and, you know, and you own the vast majority of it, yeah, you should never even think about going public. Problem is, once you start taking investors in, you either need to get them cash because you're going to have to start generating a bunch of cash and then give them distributions. And they like that, the gravy train, you know, they like that or you're going to have to go and figure out how to get them liquidity by either selling it or going public. So most companies that are on like the fast track that get really big, that's eventually what they want to do. Um, but one way or the other, you're going to have to get them cash. So you can, get, you can feed them. There's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of times what companies will do, they'll get, they'll get to a certain point and they'll start, feeding the investor, they'll start feeding the investors and then they'll go and say, you know what, our business is getting so big, I can go get a big loan from the bank. They won't give me a loan unless I'm here. But if I'm here, they'll give us a big loan. I'll get a loan and I'll go buy out some of my investors, you know, so then you don't pay them any money and you make them hungry and then you get in fights with them and then you're like, well, I can buy you out, you know, there's that, you can play that game as well. Josh, yeah. Can you give them a little flavor on competition or like, you know, you had a competitor, I think it was website store or something like that and what happened and how, just as an entrepreneur, what it's like sure. to compete for customers sure. and what you did and were you tenacious, were you soft, what were you like? Yeah, soft, <laughs> soft. Um, now, I, I always said, you know, business for me is like the sport that I always wanted to play. I just wasn't ever big enough, talented enough. Like, I knew what my body should do. It just wouldn't do it. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I always liked, I always liked business because it was a sport I felt like I was as, as uh, skilled at, um, you know, as skilled enough at as the next guy. And I remember I'd go to these lecture series at BYU, and the number one thing that I took out of it was I'm smarter than half those people and the other half smarter than me, but I'm in the range. I'm in the zone. Because sometimes I meet guys, I'm like, that guy's an idiot, you know? I'm sure you guys have met him, like these idiots, and they're driving around these crazy cars, and you know what I mean? There's some people out there that, or they're just not nice people, or they're, you know, and you're like, There's, that doesn't make sense. If they can do it, like, I can, so then what are the other things you need? You need the risk profile. Um, you know, you need the determination. And that's one thing, and we're like, well, there's a lot of people that are smarter than us, especially in, like, some of these, you know, freaks coming out of, dropping out of Stanford, and, and, you know, like the Googles of the world, like, I'm not as smart as those guys. But I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work harder. That's for sure. You know, and we're gonna try to get better people. We'll try to make a better culture. Um, but that's one thing that we used to always say to each other. Like, it'd be three in the morning. Be like, hey, what do you think the competition is doing right now? Sleeping. Um, and you know, website story. They lost because they had a stupid name. First of all, but we uh, we we at Omniture we had 80 competitors that were backed by venture capitalists. You know, they'd taken five, ten, fifty, hundred million dollars in in investment, and uh, we ended up six times larger than our second closest competitor. Uh, we put we put like 65 of them out of business. Uh, we bought two of them, and um, yeah, I mean we were ruthless for sure. You know, everyone says it's just business. No, it's not. It, it is all personal to me. Like if I lose a deal, that's someone that I don't get to hire. That's someone if I don't if I don't if if I lose if I lose deals, you know, I'm gonna start well, we're gonna start losing money in my business. I'm gonna have to fire some people. Like that's just the way it is. Or we're not gonna be able to hire the right caliber of people. You know, and I'm not gonna be able to take care of my family the way I want to take. I'm not gonna be able to live the lifestyle that I want to live. I'm not gonna be able to do the things that I want to do with my money. Um, you know, donating and helping other people out. Like I can't do that. You think this deal's not important to me? F you. Like, that's how I think. And you know, like we used to say, like I want to. I don't want to beat you. Like like there's a saying. This is uh, you know, there's a lot of people disagree with me. There's a saying like rising tide lifts all boats. Screw that, man. I want the boat sinking. I want the rising tide for me. I want all the boats sinking. You know, like when and. We just always say too, like I want to, like I don't want to just beat you, like I want to choke you out and watch the life go out of your eyes. That's, <laughs> that's how we feel about the competition. And so, like website story, you know, this stupid competitor of mine that I had, we hated them. And you know, they were a good competitor in the fact, in the sense that like they, they definitely would figure out how to screw with us. But like one time, we were uh, when we were going public, you know, we had we had like we had like nine, literally 99.9% .9 retention of our customers. We never lost our customers, and we're going public. It's like all of a sudden, I'm about to lose 20 customers. Everywhere I go, talk to an investor, like, hey, I heard you're about to lose GE as a customer. 
And the first one was like, really? What, what did you hear? Like, I didn't, I didn't know that. And I didn't know all these people are just bastards. And, you know, they're saying things to you that's not true. They're trying to figure out, if, they're trying to figure out like, how much fight you got in you. Like, the IPO Roadshow has nothing to do with their business. The, I, I got hardly any orders until the last couple of days when I was pissed off. And then ask me a question, and I'm like, why are you asking me that question? That's a stupid question. You know, I said that to an investor. And then, like, that'd get an order. I'm like, what? That's so perverse. But, um, you know, website story. So after they did that to us, I was like, oh, I'm going to get these guys back. I'm going to get them back so bad. So we took any customer, to our sales guys, we said, any, any, any customer that you go out and get that's a website story customer, $10,000 bonus, plus your normal commissions, and $10,000. And then we got... Um, Disney was, a, Disney was a $2 million a year customer for Website Story, their largest customer. They're a public company. So I knew it was their biggest customer. And um, so we've been going after Disney for like four years, and we finally got them. And uh, then and I was on, the, I was on a, like an investor, like you go around after you're public and talk to investors like once a quarter. And I heard that Website Story was saying that we were about to lose AOL, our biggest customer. And I was like, I'm done with these people. So I called. Um, we called Disney up and we said, hey, if you let us put a press release out today and say in the press release that you switched from website story to Omniture, and this is like a $2 million contract. I'm like, I'll give you $200,000 off a year. Like, I just want to say it in the press release so bad. <laughs> and they're like, $200,000? I'm like, yes. You know, <laughs> and there's nothing you can't tell investors when you're public that you did. They'd be like, what's wrong with this guy? He's psycho. But I'm like, yeah, $200,000. They're like, they're like, done. I'm like, sweet. We put a press release out the next day. I, you know those Disney, like, Mickey Mouse stuffed animals? I bought 500 Mickey Mouse stuffed animals and a Minnie Mouse stuffed animals. And I put, like, a necklace around it with a card that says, we'd like to welcome Disney, you know, to our stable of customers. They used to be with Website Story. Now they're with Omniture, just like all these other good customers. I sent it to every analyst, every investor, every press person that I could possibly imagine. And, um, yeah, I mean, that was pretty much, the, we bought them, like, six months later. That was pretty much the end of it. So... Core metrics is another good one. You guys might not have heard all these stories, so I'll tell you the core metrics one because this is a pretty good one too. Um, we were just basically entertaining ourselves um, sometimes, you know, because you get bored. But website story, we bought after we bought website story, core metrics, the next competitor, put out a um, put out a press release and a, they took out tons of ads all over the web that said, hey, just because the grill tells you what you have to eat doesn't mean you have to eat it. Don't website story customers don't go work with Omniture. And I'm like, did you just call me the gorilla? That's so cool. Um, we're totally in your head. Uh, but, you know, don't go work with Omniture, come work with Cormetrics, and we'll let you transition to our, our company for free. And we're like, oh, no, you didn't. And so we went the next day. We had, they had three offices, one in Austin, one in San Francisco, and one in San Jose. And we had people dressed in gorilla suits that went to their offices and handed out banana chips to all the employees as they walked in that said, come join Omniture just like these great customers have. We had a rolling billboard going through their parking lot all day long that said, come join Omniture just like these great customers have. And it was five logos like Home Depot, Walmart. And then the last one, um, oh, the last one was Home Depot. And they didn't know about Home Depot until that day. That's how we announced it. So I was another, I kind of paid Home Depot a little bit of money to let me do that. But, you know, again, six times larger than them. And they ended up selling for like $200 million and they'd raised like $300 million. So their investors got screwed. So, okay, questions for a couple minutes. I got one more question for you. Yeah. So, Young entrepreneurs are always looking for mentors or an advisory board or whatever. Do you do any of that? And what does it take to keep them yeah. interested in someone else? Once they get, once they, I mean, I, 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 I like doing it. I love doing it. I wait, I wait till they get a little larger um, now because I just, I, I love helping guys. People help me along the way. So once something gets to like five million and it's, you know, and it's doubling, then it starts to get interesting and then try to help people out. Yeah. What's it like being in Utah compared to the Bay Area for tech? So many people say, oh, I'm moving out of Utah to go to the Bay Area. So what's it like? Yeah, I don't, I mean, that's certainly not necessary at all. Um, you know, if you're, uh, if you were going to do something that was, I, there's, there's a bunch of companies that have been built here that are, the, that are definitely the winners in their space. And, um, you know, I think if I, was, if I was like a single guy and didn't have a company, um, or girl, didn't have a company, then it might be an interesting way to get into tech. But you definitely don't need to move your companies. There's plenty of people here. And they say, oh, I can't find any engineers. Well, good luck. We think good engineers is hanging out out there, doing nothing. It's like, it's the same problem there. Yeah. We got two minutes. Okay, fine. We got two minutes. Um, uh, what, why are you an entrepreneur? Do you do it for money, for the control of your you know, autonomy? 
Yeah, I, I did it initially just because it was exciting, it's fun, it's fulfilling. I was, I, mean, I was an actor, I was, um, I was in the accounting program, you know, looking at numbers all day long, but this is kind of what fulfilled me, all the different things that I like to do. Um, and then after I made a lot of money, then it was, you know, I, I figured the best way I can contribute now is I gave a couple million bucks to BYU, and that same week I watched my friend give $100 million to a hospital and started a children's hospital in San Francisco. I was like, that was way cooler than my two million bucks. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, maybe I can go do it again, and if I can make a billion dollars, then I can do some interesting things with it. Okay, still have time for two more questions. I'm gonna ride this out. <laughs> yeah. What was the rooster in the tank outside of your... Uh... The what? The rooster. Oh, the rooster. The tank was a generator, it was ugly. Like literally, you go in this building, because I wanted the people to still know it's a startup. So like, there's carpet ripped out all over the place and we just patched it. It was actually the same price to get new carpet, but I just didn't want people to think that we'd made it in our company, because we're raising so much money. Like it's still a startup, we gotta grind. Um, but this office like had a window, literally to a generator with a wall around it. So we just painted it blue, it cost us like two grand and made it into a tank. Um, no, no purpose. The rooster, <laughs> The rooster, um, I was driving by a pawn shop, and there was a giant rooster outside, and I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that, but I have to have it. <laughs> and so we painted it blue. Actually, Michelle, my assistant, painted it blue in her garage. Um, and uh, we started putting it in, whichever rep was the top rep, we put it in his cube, or her cube. And so you'd always know who the top rep was, because there was a nine foot rooster hanging out there. <laughs> All right, last question. This is just me and my personality. Again, everyone's different. You gotta figure out what you're good at and what your, like, your skill set's meant to do. But for me, I like starting businesses. I'll just do something in tech. I really don't think you need to make a business plan for more than like two days and just go. And you'll make mistakes. And if you put something on a credit card and lose 5,000 bucks, you're not gonna forget that mistake. All right, thanks guys. Hey, hey. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.